Good morning. Happy New Year, and welcome to St. Cecilia. Today, the Church celebrates the octave of Christmas and the solemnity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God. For those worshiping with us virtually this morning, music and prayers for today's liturgy can be found below the video on the parish's website or by clicking the flow code. Before we begin our liturgy this morning, I invite you to stand and greet your neighbor. Our opening song this morning can be found in the Gather Hymnal, number 497, Once in Royal David City, number 497. Well, good morning to all and Happy New Year, and thank you for being here. Uh, as we celebrate today a new year with great hope and also a dose of reality, that uh, there is tremendous hope in the future for all of us uh, as we look forward to a world, especially from a Christian perspective. And yet the reality is, is that we're not where we need to be. And, uh, and so maybe more said about that in a moment. But we celebrate today the feast of the solemnity of Mary, the mother of God, the mother of Jesus. And we really step back and uh, recognize really at a deeper level what all this means. We really were talking about the incarnation, that Mary is the mother of God really. In our second reading, we'll hear from um, Galatians that Paul talks about this idea that at the appointed time, God sent his son into this world to redeem it, to make us children of God. And to prove it, he, he left his spirit among us. And that is, as Christians, we live with the same spirit of Jesus. The spirit that was given to him was, is given to us at our baptism. And with that comes great hope and also great uh, responsibility. So I'd like to talk more about that in a moment uh, with the readings. We hear from the Jewish scriptures, uh, really there's a blessing that is offered to the Jewish people in the 14th century before the Christian era. And then in our gospel reading, we hear the shepherds who find Jesus. And that's loaded with really imagery as well as uh, meaning. And so more in a moment. But first, let us place ourselves by saying in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we place ourselves in the presence of a God of infinite love. We take a moment to settle ourselves and to recognize that this day we start a new year and we are being asked both to rejoice in it, but also to take to heart what it means to be a Christian in the world we live in today. And so, Lord Jesus, you called your disciples originally first to come to know who you were, how you lived, who you associated with, and what you stood for. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And Christ Jesus, it was in coming to know you that your disciples came to love you and to follow you, offering their lives on behalf of the common good of all God's people. Christ, have mercy. 
And Lord Jesus, today in this 21st century, we are those disciples who are being called to witness to the way Jesus lived so that the world does not forget that we are called to be new human beings in a new world order. Lord, have mercy. Lord. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. So before we go any further, I just want to also welcome our live streamed audience. Uh, people are watching from Boston, they're watching from throughout the United States and even from some different countries. So all are welcome in this holy and sacred space and thank you for being here. And so with that, let us pray. Loving God, who through the fruitful virginity of the Blessed Virgin Mary bestowed on the human race the grace of eternal salvation, grant that we may experience the intercession of her through whom we were found worthy to receive the author of life. And we ask this to our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated and let's listen to these readings from the Jewish scriptures who really offer a blessing from 14th centuries before Jesus up to the time when Jesus is found in a, uh, a manger. A reading from the book of Numbers. The Lord said to Moses, speak to Aaron and his sons and tell them, this is how you shall bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you kindly and give you peace. So shall they invoke my name upon the Israelites, and I will bless them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. in his mind. 
and bless us and let your faith shed its light upon us. So will you always be known upon earth and all nations learn your salvation. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. Brothers and sisters, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to ransom those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. As proof that you are sons, God sent the spirit of his sons into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then also an heir through God. The word of the Lord.
so the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The shepherds went in haste to Bethlehem and found Mary and Joseph and the infant lying in a manger. And when they saw this, they made known the message that had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed by what had been told them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things, reflecting on them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as it had been told to them. And then when eight days were completed for his circumcision, the child was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, at the beginning of Mass, I mentioned this idea that you know, we enter into a new year today, probably with great hope. New Year's always brings New Year's resolutions. We're going to do things differently. And yet from a per perspective of faith, particularly Christian faith, there is really a sense of obligation in this, that we are called to live in deeper and deeper ways, discerning the will of God in the world we live in, as well as following Jesus, the values he lived by, in a world that basically does not accept them. And so I'd like to really address my remarks more or less to that, talking on three different levels. First, I'd like to talk about the scriptures themselves. And then second, really about when the shepherds, this is a story. What happened, we don't really know. But the story has meaning. And the story is really telling us something about profound, about Jesus and the God he believed in, the so-called father of creation. And then third, I'd like to speak really on the level of today, the 21st century. What does this mean to us as Christians? So first, the scriptures. The first reading is from the book of Numbers. That's part of the Jewish Pentateuch, the Jewish Torah, the basic uh, part of the Jewish scriptures. It's called Numbers because it begins with a census of the people and the book ends with a census. That's the reason for its name. However, the book itself is really about the 40 years or so that the Jewish people wandered in the desert as they left Egypt and moved towards Canaan, the promised land, a land that had, was said to be growing, uh, flowing in milk and honey and was being given to them by God so that they could prosper as God would have them prosper. And what we find in that is really this idea that Moses, 1400 years or so uh, before Jesus really uh, is born, is really talking to these people as they enter into this journey. And he's telling Aaron, his brother, and other priestly people of this clan of Jewish people how to offer a blessing from God to the people. And we hear it's a beautiful prayer of really telling them to say that God blesses you and keeps you. God offers God's light upon you and he offers to be gracious to you. And God will even looks upon you and offers you peace. To put it all together, really what it is, it's a blessing of God's love, of God's eternal love for the people God had chosen to demonstrate to this world what it means to be a human being, how we're called to live. And then in our gospel reading, we hear the story of the shepherds. What precedes the reading we have here is that the shepherds are in a field and they hear somehow a voice of God telling them that nearby in Bethlehem, there has been born unto this world a savior, a Messiah, and they'll find him in a, in a crib, in, in a barn, more or less. And they set out in haste, we're told, and that's what they find. This child is born in a feeding trowel. And they tell Mary what they had heard and how this had, the promise that they had heard had been fulfilled. And we're told Mary, the mother of God, the mother of, of, of uh, Jesus, ponders these things in her heart. And I can only imagine a woman giving birth to a baby, a newborn, especially perhaps their firstborn, wondering what will happen 
Great hope, great expectation, and yet the reality that who knows, not everything turns out as we'd like it to be. Mary has been called by many as the first disciple of Jesus. Thirty years later, Jesus would call disciples. But Mary is the first to really hear this voice, this message, not knowing what will happen and yet trusting that God somehow is in this and that she will follow as best she can what God is asking of her. It's an incredible story of humility, an incredible story of faith. And so that is Mary. And what we find is, my second point, is that this is a story. And it, what's interesting about it is how God enters human history. The expectation in first century Jewish Palestine was that God would enter human history. There was the expectation, and it was going to come soon, likely in the lifetime of these people who were living at this time. The expectation was that God would enter history triumphantly. God would overthrow the Roman powers that be, and God would establish this Messiah as a temporal power who would rule over the region and allow the Jewish people to live as God had wanted them to live. And it didn't happen that way. What we find is God entering human history in the midst of poverty, oppression, marginalization, and a controlling power, the Roman people at this time. Not what was expected. Even John the Baptist, when he was imprisoned by Herod, sent his disciples to Jesus saying, are you the one? Or are we to expect somebody different? Even John expected someone powerful coming in. And instead of power, what we find in Jesus' life as it unfolds is humility and not violence, but a passivity towards life and God that incarnates God's love in this world, that offers God's compassion for human suffering, and, and has the courage to speak truth to power. Truth to power that will say, the world that we live in today in Jesus' time is not fair and it must change. God created all and God desires the salvation of each and every one of us. And that is not what Jesus had in his time. Jesus was killed not because he healed the sick, the crippled, the blind, the lame, the mute. He was killed because he spoke truth to power to the religious and secular authorities of his time. He told them this is a corrupt way of life and that Yahweh, the Jewish God, is not happy and that there will be a price to pay. Jesus preached this kingdom of God, telling people to repent, that different than the other prophets who had come before him who preached a future time when all would be made right, Jesus said, it's come in my time, in me, in my words, and my, and my actions. So we have a contrast here. In the first century Jewish Palestine, people were expecting, as we always hear as, as Christians, this all-powerful and glorious God who we believe will come at the second coming with Jesus. That is a belief of Christians, that there will come a day when God is or rules over this world in, with God's values of love, compassion, and justice for all people. And yet, in first century Jewish Palestine, what they found was a lesser God, a God who was not powerful, a God who was meek, humble, and offered a new way of living for human beings in a new world order. And we know as the story unfolds 30 years later, it is rejected by human society. Collusion between religious and secular authorities to say we will erase him from the face of the earth. And as Christians, we believe that God may have said, you can do that, but I will raise him from the dead <laughs> because this is what I'm looking for. Human beings who will live in a new world order as new people, living the values of God and not the values of society. <laughs> Incredible message. Incredible imagery when you think about it. This was likely the intent of Luke. It's a story, he made it up. But what he has is a powerful message behind it. That if we believe Jesus is the second person of the Blessed Trinity, it becomes vitally important 
that each Sunday when we hear these Gospels about his life, that we pay particular attention to what they're saying. Because how Jesus lived tells us something about the unseen God we seek, a God who is not interested in power, a God who's interested in all of, all of God's creation, and interested in those who would follow Jesus, would live as he lived in this world. And so my final point is what does it mean to us today? It's a beautiful story, it's a profound story. But if we believe Jesus is the second person of the Blessed Trinity, he is God incarnate walking among us, then it behooves us to take a serious look at his life and how he lived. And as we enter into a new year, to step back and think, where do I stand in terms of this kind of a religion? Religion has been co-opted by the powers that be so that we are pacified and we accept the status quo. That will get none of us killed. But I suggest, too, that it may not mean a very meaningful life. Jesus took a step into the darkness. Mary took a step into the darkness to follow the will of God and to follow Jesus in this world. Christian faith is verifiable through the actions of our lives. It is one thing to say, I believe all the dogma. And as someone told me, Catholics, no one does better than Catholics, ritual. We have incense. We have chanting. It's beautiful, but it's not enough. What Jesus talked about was following him in the world in which we live. We have a world in chaos that is broken. We have a society that's broken. We have a political system that's broken because of self-interest and greed. Because the powers that be want to maintain the power they have. They want to maintain the economic superiority that they have. And that is not what Jesus preached. Jesus preached a world where we would be on the lookout for people in need and respond to the needs they have and have the courage to tell the powers that be that they must change. If we do that, most of us won't be killed, but we will experience pushback. The powers of society don't want that. They will, they will push back and say, we do not like what you are doing. If you do it at a high enough level, you will be eliminated as Jesus was eliminated. And I offer just two examples in our own time. Martin Luther King in the 60s stood up to the powers that be in this country and said it's racist and it must change. And he was eliminated because of what he did. In the 80s, or 1980 exactly, uh, Oscar Romero in El Salvador. I lived in El Salvador after Romero was killed and after the Jesuits, there were six Jesuits killed there in 1989. I arrived in that country within a couple of weeks of, that, of their being killed. Romero, the Jesuits, Rutulio Grande, others, many others, stood up to the oligarchy in El Salvador, which was originally 14 families that owned the entire country. Over 90% of the wealth owned by 14 families. The rest of the country lived in abject poverty. And people like Romero, people like the Jesuits, Rutulio Grande said, no, this is not the Christian way of living and it must change. The powers that be eliminated them. They were a threat to the status quo. And so for us today, as we enter into a new year, we are called to step back and take seriously the religion we believe in. We can say, I'm a Christian. I believe in all the dogma. I believe in a Trinitarian God. I believe Jesus is human and divine. <clears throat> it's all true, we believe, but it's not enough. Because Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, take up your cross and follow me into the world that really exists, where there is human suffering all over the world and right here in Boston. I run a program called A Faith That Does Justice, and it has two functions. One is to try to educate people like us, perhaps, people who are educated, and say that it's good that you're educated, it's good that you have uh, talents to be used, but it's not enough to use them just for yourself. We need to reach out beyond ourselves to people in need. And that can include no, going no further than someone in your own family, 
someone maybe with a recent diagnosis of Alzheimer's or a recent diagnosis of cancer, perhaps a child with a learning disability or a diagnosis of cancer, to say, I will use what I can to try to help these people as Jesus did, to have the compassion of the people who are suffering. It may go further than that. It may go to this church congregation. We may know somebody who's in need that we can help. It may go to a civic organization that you people are involved in. Somehow saying, I must live beyond myself. Living God's love and compassion. And maybe even for some, there is the opportunity to say, I will take this leap into the, actness, into the darkness and live to move from an experience of God's love into its fulfillment in an act of justice on behalf of the world in which we live. This is serious religion. This is adult religion. This is what it means to be a Christian Catholic in the world we live in today. And it's not easy. And so I say finally we step back as we enter into a new year. Perhaps it is a time when we can look at where do we stand before the God we claim to believe in. Is it just a rote religion that we may have learned in grammar school? Many adults do not live beyond a third grade religion. And yet, in their professions, they may be national or internationally recognized. The incongruity between a spiritual relationship with God and our actions in society is wide. And I think this is a time of year where we can say, where do I stand? How do I deepen my relationship with God to do God's will in this world as best I can? And how do I actually follow Jesus in this world and it is more than saying, I believe in the Trinity. It is saying, I will take, like Mary, like Jesus, a leap into the darkness and say, I will do what I can to incarnate God's love in this world, to live with God's compassion for human suffering, and to hopefully one day have the courage to say, I will stand up and speak truth to power and suffer the consequences for doing so. That, I think, is the message of New Year's. That is the message of Mary and the solemnity of her feast, the mother of God, the mother of Jesus. And so, may I ask you to stand? And In reciting this creed, we really, let's contemplate too. This is what we believe. And it challenges us to move beyond that to action on behalf of God's will. And so we say together, we believe in one God. <coughs> Heaven and earth, of all the ages of the world is in. Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, Lord of God, for all ages. God from God, right from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, one in being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. In him now from heaven, by the Holy Spirit, who was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified. We know it's spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And with that now, we offer our prayers and petitions before this God of infinite love who desires to look down upon us and bring us peace in this world. For us as church, for all Christians, and for all who worship God by any name, may all hearts be open to a deeper appreciation of God's many blessings. We pray. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. For the repose of the soul of Pope Benedict XVI and in gratitude for his life of service in the Church, we pray. God, hear Lord, our hear our prayer. For the world's leaders, 
that all in positions of power may serve with humility and a sense of responsibility for the common good. We pray. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For those who feel disregarded or insignificant, and for those who disregard others, for the awareness that all are equally chosen and blessed, we pray. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For the human community, that together we may forge a future worthy of our calling as children of God, we pray. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For peace across this planet, wherever there is war and violence, particularly in Ukraine, for peacemakers, negotiators, those fighting to protect their country, and those living under siege with no recourse to heat, power, or water, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For the sick and suffering among us, Jane Callahan, Cheryl Sabin, Roger Dumont, Kathleen Donnellan, Almira Izumchensky, John O'Brien, Jim Mutos, Kevin Conkannon, Stephen Maroney, Rod Rizutko, Constance Fliss, George Abdu, Joe Wilson, Amy Parker, Janice Lathrop, Lauren DiGennaro, Thomas Sullivan, Edward Apuzzo, Joe Zum, Bob Halley, Tim Pert, Mike and Lori Howland, Kevin Kennedy, Robert Heidel, Terry Clark, Tony Alvarez, Patrick Dillon, Sadie Cosgrove, Stella Daniolt, Peggy Breslin, Suzanne Papa, Joyce Ray Brown, Caroline Bucchino, Luann Smith, and Rick Gallardi. We pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, particularly Christopher Thomas Murray, Mary Orban, Father Donald Clifford, Jacob Schleins, Paul Gilbert, Dorothy Collins, Kathy Wirtz, Frank Keimig, Bob Ludwig, Francis Schleib, and all those we remember through our Christmas flowers. For their eternal peace, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. And for the intentions we hold in the silence of our hearts. We pray. God, hear our prayer. Loving God, you've heard the prayers we've brought before you this morning. We ask you to hear them, consider them, and to grant us what we truly need. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I would invite you to be seated as we enter into our Eucharistic celebration.
Well, pray, my sisters and brothers, that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God the Almighty. May the Lord accept the sacrifices you have And let us pray. Loving God, who in your kindness begin all good things and bring them to fulfillment, grant to us who find joy in the solemnity of the Holy Mother of God, that just as we glory in the beginning of your grace, so one day we may rejoice in its completion. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And so the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, loving God, almighty and eternal one. For by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, Mary conceived your only begotten Son, and without losing the glory of virginity, brought forth into the world the eternal light, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him the angels praise your majesty, dominions adore, and powers tremble before you. Heaven and the virtues of heaven and this blessed seraphim Worship together with exultation. And so may our voices, our voices join with theirs as in humble praise we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O God, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. And so therefore we humbly ask you, by the same Spirit graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when the supper was ended, Jesus took the cup, and again giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and he gave the cup to his disciples, saying, take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins, and do this in memory of me. And this is the mystery of our faith. And so therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of Jesus' passion, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look upon the offering of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one God, one Spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the apostles, the martyrs, and all the saints on whose constant intercession 
In your presence, we rely for unfailing help. And may this sacrifice of our reconciliation advance the peace and salvation of the entire world. And so be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, Sean, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all clergy, all religious, and the entire people you have gained for your own. And listen graciously to the prayers of this family, whom you have summoned here before you this day. And in your compassion, O merciful God, Gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. And to our departed brothers and sisters, <coughs> and especially at this time we remember Pope Benedict VI, Christopher Thomas Murray, Mary Orban, Father Donald Clifford, Jacob Schleins, Paul Gilbert, Dorothy Collins, Kathy Wirtz, Frank Kamig, Bob Ludwig, and Francis Scheib, and all those who we remember at, with, uh, through our Christmas flowers. And so we also ask you, to, who, you who are pleasing to all who are passing from this life, we ask you to grant them kind admittance to your kingdom. For there we hope to enjoy forever with them the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. For it is through him, with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. And now as disciples of Jesus, who desire to discern God's will and follow Jesus, living his love, compassion, and justice in this world. Let us pray the prayer that he taught his own disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and graciously grant us peace in our days, that through the help of your mercy we may be free from sin and safe from all distress, as we joyfully await the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace. My peace I give you. Look not upon our sins, but upon the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. And may the peace of the risen Christ be with each and every one of you. And let us offer each other some sign of that peace. Christ's peace to all. Peace. 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 Peace be with you. This is Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to the Supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but on the side of the Lord in my soul. May the body and blood of Jesus the Christ keep us all safe for eternal life. Amen.
Well, let us pray. Loving God, we have received this heavenly sacrament with joy. Grant that it may lead us to eternal life, for we rejoice to proclaim the blessed ever-Virgin Mary, mother of your Son and mother of the Church, through Christ our Lord. 
And so I don't think we have announcements. I'd like to just say one, two things. One is, uh, if anything I said today resonates with you, this idea that, you know, Christianity, quite frankly, is more than um, just a doctrinal uh, belief. It's really action in society. And I'll just one anecdote is uh, many, many people here would probably know uh, G.K. Chesterton, the writer, British writer, now deceased. But he won many awards for his writing, and many of them were really had Christian themes of redemption. The bad guy finds a way to find good. And uh, he was once questioned by the press saying, you know, Mr. Chesterton, uh, you write these stories, these novels about uh, Christianity, and quite frankly, Christianity hasn't changed the world in 2,000 years. And his response was, it's, it's not that Christianity has been tried and found difficult. It's that Christianity has been found difficult and left untried. So it's something to think about. It's more than doctrinal belief. It's really living adult faith in action on behalf of people, people in need. God created all and God desires the salvation of all. If you're interested in knowing more, I have a little card at the back of church, happy to give it to you. And for those online, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Faith Justice USA. So that's really it. The other thing I want to do is always thank our wonderful uh, choir accompaniment. Thank you very much for all of what you do. And so the Lord be with you. And may our God of great love and compassion and justice for all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, descend upon each and every one of us and remain forever. Our Mass is ended. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord and one another. Thank you for being here. Have a wonderful new year, a uh, wonderful celebration today, if, that's, if it hasn't already occurred, and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you.